but I also had to break off this like performance thing that I had no I I had no idea that's like how I was functioning in life until it was taken away and I was like Welcome back to the Cypress Room where we dive deep on influencing with integrity. I'm Maggie Honeycutt. And I'm Christina Mascari, and we are back for a solo podcast today. No interviews. That's right. Today, but we've been having a lot of fun doing the interviews. I have absolutely loved it. Yeah, but then it makes it a little challenging when we sit down to just talk with us. We're like, <laughs> okay, we have to come up with a whole topic yeah. and talk for one hour. And we were brainstorming this morning, and I have wanted to talk about corporate moms versus stay at home moms, um, the benefits, the struggles. And basically, we're kind of coming out of that season where our kids are in school and it has given us more freedom to be able to work. And so we have our own businesses now. And just we've done both of those things. We've been corporate and we've been stay at home moms. So kind of the things that we gleaned from both that are helping us in this walk of entrepreneurship. But I think it's just like a whole it's a whole thing. It is a big thing for if you are a mother and that decision I think it's a lot of it's something that men don't have to walk through a lot there are some men I know that stay home and do most of the you know the child rearing at home and are stay-at-home dads but I don't have any experience in that so we're not going to talk about that today so this is I don't know for some reason this was on my heart it's very off the cuff we don't have a lot of notes so I have no idea where this is going to go but that kind of is what makes some of these fun yeah (laughs) I think that we have walked the corporate world to motherhood, to entrepreneurship. And I think that's an interesting journey. And it's something that whenever someone in the corporate world decides to start a family, that they have to face kind of those decisions Mm -hmm. um, and make a decision that works best for their family. But I know as women, there is a lot of heartstrings attached to it, maybe more so than um, it would be as a male. I think males are able to compartmentalize the things maybe a little bit more than women. And I'm obviously that's just a generalization, but I know for a mom, kind of those heart feelings, their emotions, it's all wrapped up into one package. Right. Um, And if you're not in the season of motherhood, don't check out on me because if you are planning to start a family one day, I think this is still going to be encouragement to you. If you're like a grandma and you're like, I'm already through all this stuff, I want you to stick around too because I want you to see like everything that you've walked through and I want it to be an encouragement to you looking back and reflecting on, oh my gosh, I did do those things. I did make those hard decisions. So don't check out on me if you're not like in the season of motherhood. I think everybody can glean something from this. And if you happen to be a male watching, I mean, that would be rare because our audience is (laughs) very, very female. But if you're a male watching, hey, stick around too because you might learn something as well. We all have something to learn, even if we're not in that direct season yeah, at that moment. Absolutely. Yeah. So where do you want to start? Um. Okay. Where do I want to start? That's a good question. Um. I guess we've kind of shared some of our story of where, like what we've walked through and how we've come to like be where we're at. And so I'm a person that came from a very high performance driven lifestyle, the way I felt loved and seen and you know, successful and important was a lot of how I was doing in my career, which is funny because I never had like a big career, a big job where I was making lots of money. Um, I was a corporate communications professional, so I never made more than $40,000 in a year. So I had, you know, coordinator positions. They were not big roles, but it was just very important to me to get a good performance, to have that feedback of you're doing a great job, to have that approval from my boss and from my colleagues always saying like, you just did so great on that event. You did great on that project. Those are the things that really fueled me. Um, And so then moving into motherhood, it was like all of that was taken away because your kids don't give you any feedback. And if they do give you feedback, it's not good. (laughs) It's usually, I don't like you, mommy. No, I don't want to do that. Um, So those were, that was something that I had to deal with, like from the very beginning of realizing when I decided to stay home with my kids. First of all, I had to take a huge pay cut and figure out how to budget better in our family and make money go further. But I also had to break off this like performance thing that I had no, I, I had no idea that's like how I was functioning in life until it was taken away. And I was like, I have no accolades. I have no awards. I have no 
review? Like, am I even doing a good job? What is what is going on? So that was like my main struggle um, switching from, you know, career driven to motherhood. I don't know about you. You had a bigger job than me and you were like, you made bonuses and you were in sales. So yours might be a little different. <laughs> yeah, I I was in corporate sales for 10 years and I too very much kind of believed the lie that if I perform, then I'll be loved or accepted or fill in the blank. So I hinged so much on my performance and the ability to please the people I was working for. Um, And I actually, you know, the last year that I was pregnant with my daughter right before I felt like the Lord was asking me to surrender that whole career, um, I was at the top. I had one president's club, which was like for the top 2% performers. I mean, it was like everything. I was working towards everything I thought that I wanted. Um, I wanted to be the corporate ladder climber because I got so much fulfillment out of. Yeah, it feels good. I mean, I'm not going to lie. And the accolades. Yeah. And I always, even now as an entrepreneur, sometimes when it's a hard day, I'm like, man, I just, I romanticized that corporate life because I loved knowing exactly what was expected of me, getting feedback, um, seeing physical like numbers and standings and I thrived on that and so when the Lord asked me to surrender and lay that all down um to be just a mom for a season it was incredibly difficult but look at how you still say just a mom (laughs) I know you know what I mean you're so right yeah because and at the time that's exactly what I thought it was devastating dating to me yeah and did you ever go back no or did so during your maternity leave you just turned in your notice yeah did you know before you went into your maternity leave that you were gonna do that I think right as I went on maternity leave was when the shift happened but all the way up into it I was trying to figure out how you were going to travel five days a week with a newborn (laughs) and a husband that travels oh I I mean you could do Lulu is that how they say it now (laughs) I don't even know you would have had to have a live in nanny yes yeah I would have did you guys talk about that and think about that at all Yes, we okay. did think about the reality of it a lot. And I spent a lot of time, I actually interviewed for several other positions in my company that had more like localized territories. And it was like just nothing. Every door was shut mm-hmm. along the way. And I I know there was a moment, I can't remember it specifically, but I remember there was a moment where I was praying about it and I just really felt like God told me in that moment that if I, well, I should back up. One of my prayers was that I would be able to change um, the legacy of my family because in my family line, there was just a lot of dysfunction and addiction and just all sorts of trauma and I don't know, just things that I wanted to not continue on with my own family. And I just really felt like the Lord told me um, that if I did want to change the legacy of my family, that this was one way that he was going to work that out in our lives was me surrendering (laughs) that ident the place where I'd found all of my identity and my source um, and just surrender all of that and for a season focus on just being a mom and pouring into my kids. And that was probably the hardest year of my life. Yeah. That first year. Yeah. Well, and mine is different than yours because when I went into my maternity leave, there was not a thought in my mind that I'm going to stay home. Like I didn't want to, again, because I had that performance thing. I'm like, well, if I'm not working, who am I? And if my kids don't see me working, like what does that say to them? Like I want them to work hard and I want them to, you know, I wanted them to be like me. (laughs) Which is funny now because you think your kids are going to be like you and they will not be if you are not a mom yet. I I don't know. You just, you don't, it's so, 
motherhood is a wonderful there are so many wonderful things about it but there's nothing that any podcast or any class or any course can prepare you for how you change Mm -hmm. like I am a different person since I've had a child but in so many wonderful ways but in so many ways you do lose parts of yourself and you do have to sacrifice them and one thing that I think just stinks about this country about America is our maternity paternity leave times I mean in other countries they get 18 months. They get yeah. a year with their kid without their job being in jeopardy. And because I had to make this decision in in six weeks, basically, I think I, maybe I had a little bit longer than that. I can't remember how long my maternity leave has it's been a long time. But it was shorter than three months. I'm it was definitely yeah. shorter than three months. I mean, I took as much time as I could. Like there were ways to like add your PTO on top of it. And I saved all my vacation time. So I took literally every day that I could. And um, I don't know, it was somewhere into like four weeks, six weeks, I had such an easy baby and he was so sweet. And definitely the first like two weeks, I was like, I am never going to make it. Like, what is going on? I am not bonded to this child. I am freaking out. I don't know what to do because it's that like control thing and that performance thing. I have no idea if I'm doing well or not. Yeah. Nursing was not going well for me. So that was basically the only thing that I'm judging on. Like, how many diapers has he had today? How many ounces has he, has he fed? How has, long has he stayed on? And that wasn't going well. So I was like sinking fast. Um, but somewhere in like the four to six weeks, I just hit a stride. He started sleeping more at night. And then I was like, wow, I kind of really like this. <laughs> and mm-hmm. my husband had always wanted me to stay home, but he was never going to force that on me or like push it like he always said you know it's going to be your decision and I'll support you and what you want to do so we had a daycare lined up and everything and um so I I had I didn't think I was going to stay home at all and then towards the end of my maternity leave I'm like well maybe I am well I'm going to go back for six months and I'll see and I just remember going back those first even that first week back I was like, what am I doing here? And I was calculating like how much I was spending on childcare, which is another thing that stinks about this country because yeah. you're sitting there and you're doing the same amount of work, but it's taking like half, it was taking half of my salary away just to have somebody else watch my kid all day. And then I'm pumping at work. I'm like isolated. I, my body and hormones are out of control and I'm having to sit here at work like with a bunch of men, a lot of men. <laughs> That don't understand anything that's going on. And it was just, I don't know, like, it's wild, the things that you have to deal with as a woman and motherhood and still trying to be yourself and do that corporate thing. And I have so much respect for people who can do both. Mm -hmm. Because I did it for a week or two weeks, maybe. And then I was like, I'm out, like, I'm done. Again, it was like a word from the Lord that he gave me. And I was like, I'm going to be obedient, even though I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And I feel like my whole life is going to change because my whole identity is wrapped up in like, I'm corporate communications, Christina. <laughs> um, and it just, I don't know. I, I do just have a lot of respect for women who know how to balance that career and that all the, the hormones and the, the like mental power and the emotions that go into raising children and having to pay that much money for childcare because it's astronomical. And I'm sure it's even worse now. Yeah. Because I know back then we were paying like a couple of thousand dollars a month and now it can be like $15,000 a month. Um, So that is just all that kind of stinks for us that we have to choose. Yes. Yeah, it is. I mean, I admire women who can do both um, the corporate world and motherhood and make it look effortless. I I see them all the time at my kids' school and I'm in awe of it. Um, And it also, though, on the flip side, makes me so excited that there are now, I mean, compared to when we were having kids and exiting the corporate world, if a mom does want to still work and have a family, there's so many more opportunities for entrepreneurship yep. now than I feel like maybe there were when we were having kids. Yeah. So if somebody does still want to work but feels very restricted by the limitations of a corporate job, their entrepreneurship is such a wonderful thing yeah. for that person. Yeah. Well, and I think there are more remote opportunities than yes. there were when we were, because again, we had our first children, what, like 13 and 12 years ago? Mm-hmm. Is that how old your oldest is now? 12? So a lot has changed, yes. <laughs> which I need to, you know, I don't really know what's going on. So there is, you are able to do more remote and more part-time. 
for me, I'm glad that I didn't have that option because I think I would have held on to like my corporate life. And it was something that really looking back now, it needed to be broken off of me. And I needed to have a season where I was sacrificing and doing something maybe that I didn't necessarily want to do. And I feel really bad saying that, but I didn't, I didn't want to be a stay at home mom. I didn't want to take care of the house. I hate cleaning. I hate laundry. Like those are the things that I, as soon as I had a job again, that I farmed out that I hire because I don't enjoy doing those things. And I didn't find satisfaction in them. I didn't find joy in them. Um, And I was just honest with God about that. I was like, I hate this. Like, I don't want to be, you know, fixing everybody lunch and whatever. And it sounds really bad saying that you guys, but that's how I felt. Yeah. And, um, but God just didn't work on my heart. It was like, how about you do it unto me? Like, if you don't want to, if this is some, this isn't something you enjoy, like, this is what I'm asking you to do in this season. Can you just do it unto me? Like, do you trust me? And those were the things looking back now that I said yes to something that I wanted, didn't want to do. So then now he's blessed me with something that I have a lot of fun with that I get to be my own boss, that I get to choose my day, that I get to hire out the things that I don't like to do, which is such a blessing and a privilege. Um, but in the season of motherhood, it was very hard to walk out that day to day because nobody sees what you're doing. Mm-hmm. The only person who really sees what you're doing are your kids. Your husband kind of knows what's going on, but he's not there for like the the hour and hours that you're just sitting with your kids and saying the same thing over again and changing diaper after diaper and fixing food after food and picking up after mm-hmm. and trying to reason with someone who ha- doesn't even understand what reason is yet. Those are like, I feel like that stuff prepared me more for what I'm doing now than the corporate world did. Really? Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I agree with you. I motherhood for me was the ultimate refining process. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had the worst attitude about it for a really long time. If I mean, we need to have somebody totally on here that like honest. loved stay at home and mother because I know there's people out there that are just like made for it and called for it and And that was not me I had to be taught and trained yes (laughs) I remember looking at women who just thrived in motherhood and loved every minute of it and just wondering like gosh I wish I could be like that but for me it was the ultimate learning to rely on the Lord for everything and also to just kind of die to myself (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because I didn't realize how selfish and self-focused I was um, until I had kids and went through the time of having little babies and toddlers at home. And that was definitely a tough, tough season. But I think, like you said, it did prepare me for entrepreneurship to be able to really just rely on the Lord for feedback, to rely on him for whatever it is that I need to trust him to also, um, I don't know, not be so self focused. I'm, I probably still am in a lot of ways, but much less than before. It's hard. So how do you think it prepared you? Motherhood prepared you for entrepreneurship? Um, I think it just prepared me for, again, that You don't get a lot of feedback, I think, when you're an entrepreneur and you have to just kind of figure it out. And it's a lot of trial and error. Yeah. And I think that's tons of what parenthood is. And for me, lately, a lot of parenthood is being like, I messed up. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like, I lost my temper. Um, I'm frustrated with you, but that doesn't give me the right to act this way. And um, so I th- I have to do a lot of that because when you're an entrepreneur and things go sideways or you lose a deal or like a company doesn't want to negotiate with you, it's really easy to be like, well, I've done nothing wrong. Yeah. <laughs> because you don't have anybody else sitting there being like, um, excuse me, maybe you should look at this and look at that. So it's helped me to do de- it. Help- Motherhood helped prepare me to be like, OK, I am not perfect in entrepreneurship. It is trial and error. And just because one day I feel like I've taken five steps back and the next day I'm going to take a step forward. And maybe I'll take five steps forward. And then it's just like, it's cyclical. Mm-hmm. And motherhood is very cyclical. I think corporate world for me just felt like very steady because I wasn't in, I, I wasn't in charge. And so it wasn't like if something went wrong, it's like, well, it's the CEO's fault or it's whoever's <laughs> fault. I mean, you know, like there was, I always had a boss and my boss had a boss. So there was, 
you know, I didn't have, I didn't have a lot to, I didn't have a lot at stake. And in motherhood, everything's on the line. And in entrepreneurship, everything's on the line. And if I would have gone straight from corporate to entrepreneurship and not had that, you know, seven years of training of like, guess what? You don't know what you're doing yeah. and you're going to fail a lot, but you're going to get yourself back up and it's going to be fine. And like your kids are going to be fine. And guess what? I do that in my business now. My business is going to be fine. Like I have really bad days where I lose lots of money. I have great days where I make lots of money. And it's just like when you ride, you learn how to ride those peaks and valleys, I think a lot more in motherhood than I ever did in the corporate world just because of my role, because I was like a coordinator. I was never a manager of anybody. So I don't know what that experience is like. It might feel a little bit different and obviously prepare you more for entrepreneurship if you're managing people. But I yeah. never managed anybody. So, yeah, I think it requires entrepreneurship requires a lot of humility. For sure. <laughs> and that's what <laughs> parenthood yes. humbles you in so many ways. Yeah. Oh, it humbles you. I think, too, in entrepreneurship and in motherhood and being a parent, you really have to have the big picture in mind a lot. Mm -hmm. You have to be very forward thinking. For me in the corporate world, it was, I'm thinking about this year, this month, It very short-sighted, sort of how you're organizing yourself and your efforts and your days and your goals. And in motherhood, I think you have to have that, the long-term, the big picture in mind. Because if you get caught up in the day-to-day, Whoa, you might just bow out. I don't know. And same with entrepreneurship. Like you said, when you have the bad weeks, when you have have to take a step back, you you really have to have that big picture, that big goal in mind of what you're working towards, or you probably people probably would give up, right? Yep. And so it's just it's a different um approach, a different mindset. And I I do think there are a lot of parallels in how motherhood can prepare you to be a successful entrepreneur for yeah sure. another thing that i think motherhood prepared me for is because in motherhood you're at the beginning you're so isolated mm -hmm. like you have to go out and find play groups or like join a mom's group and i always did those things even yeah. when i'm like i feel like i don't have time for this oh my gosh i have to get the kid ready and actually leave the house and i lived in you know minnesota and illinois so it was a feat to have to leave the house with the kids yeah. in the winter um, but I always forced myself to do those. And, you know, I would have some that would be some play dates that would be super awkward. And they would mm. be like, I would be like, oh, my gosh, I'm never doing this again. But I kept just like going out and trying to find my people. And that I have not done that in I've done that kind of in my job. But I realized this past year that I was super isolated. Like I had some contact, but I didn't have a lot like week to week. I didn't have a lot of consistency mm -hmm. in that community. And last year. God just put that word on my heart community and I just worked on being intentional with people that do what I do. And so now I have a group of like seven people and we're on a Marco Polo and we talk weekly, if not daily, um, about work stuff, but also about life. And so having that community has helped me just in my sanity and being an entrepreneur and helping me feel like I'm not an island and helping me feel like I'm not alone. So, and that was definitely something that I learned in motherhood, but it took me a long time to incorporate it into being an entrepreneur. So I think one of the things I need to do is like, what else did I learn in motherhood that I'm that I have not carried over into entrepreneurship and how can it help me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I was trying to think of the same thing for myself. What else did I learn in motherhood? I think you just learn to do hard things. Too. Oh, yeah. You learn to yes. be stretched beyond what you think is possible. Mm -hmm. You learn that you can do more than you ever thought you could, that you can survive on less sleep than you ever thought mm -hmm. you could, that you can fit more things in the hours of the day mm -hmm. than you ever thought you could. You I, can survive on less money because yes. kids cost a lot of money. And yes. then when you decide to stay <laughs> at home, it is a shock. Yes, it is. But you figure it out. You do. You know, I you complain along the way. Yes. And you miss fancy dinners and you miss fancy trips, but things come back around. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I saw this really funny meme and it was, um, and it said what people without kids, what I imagine they're doing. And it's two people laying in a pile of cash. 
Especially now since my daughter does competitive dance know. and yours is doing club com- volleyball. Club volleyball is just and I like thought that. That uh, is the truest meme. That I've ever those seen. are like my favorite. That's like you guys know dance mom content is like what my TikTok is yeah. filled with. And I saw the funniest one the other day. It's a woman like, "What I imagine my life to be if my daughter hadn't got into competitive dance?" And she's in her backyard being like, "This is where we're gonna put the Olympic sized pool." And then we'll have our butler who will come and I'm like, it's so funny. It's because it's accurate. <laughs> oh, my goodness. oh my gosh, that's funny. It's worth it though. It is worth it. And you know, we're, I mean, we're technically, we're not stay at home moms anymore because we're entrepreneurs, but we're really not, we're kind of corporate moms now because although our kids are in school, they're only in school, you know, during the day. There's mm-hmm. still lots of pickups and runarounds. You still have to cook dinner for your kids. So there's still, you know, we're kind of in a little bit in both worlds. It is. It does get easier, ladies, if you are in the yeah. throes with those toddlers and those babies. Ooh, I'm just praying for you right yes. now. I'm thinking of a couple of creators I know that have little tiny, t- tiny ones, and I don't know how we all do it. Um, so I just, you know, it will... Parts of it get easier. Parts of it get more challenging. There's more mental things. There's more humility that comes in. But the exhaustedness of motherhood with the toddlers and the babies, it, it, there is light at the end of the tunnel. They will wipe their own butt one day. Yeah. They will be able to make themselves a snack. Although, bless my 13-year-old, he burned macaroni and cheese, you guys. A couple. Blew up the microwave. We had to get a new microwave because <laughs> he put Easy Mac in the microwave without water. And microwaved it the whole time. And I like come out. I'm like, is there a fire? And he let it burn the whole two minutes. He would be so bad if he knew I told that story. But, you know, I mean, it, you're a parent until you're, you're parenting until they leave the house. You're a parent your whole life, but you're responsible for their lives until they leave the house. So, but it does, it does get easier in ways. I yeah. think I would encourage all those parents who are working and have littles at home to just even though it's so hard, it's just a season. It's just a it's season. It's just a season. And it it does. I, I mean, everyone tells you when you're in it, it goes by fast and you're stuck in that day to day and you think it'll never end. And then one day it's just mm-hmm. behind you. And they're so cute. Yes. I'm always so like, cute. there's a reason that God makes babies and toddlers so cute because yeah. otherwise you would just be like, go away. But then you <laughs> look at them and they just say those cute little things and you're like, oh, you're just so cute. They are so cute well I want to talk a little bit more about like why you think there's I think we're better at it now but there still is that war of corporate mom versus stay-at-home mom and what do you think is behind that why do you think there is such a like seems to always be fighting like my way is the best I see that type of content all the time oh really I do I I I haven't in a while so I thought maybe that like wasn't as prevalent but I think if I asked myself why back in the day I used to get caught up with it and it's those feelings of guilt probably on either side Mm -hmm. guilt that you have chosen to continue your career while having a family and then the other side is maybe some of that guilt for staying at home and not bringing in an income for your family I'm just guessing here but if I put myself in that place that's probably where I could get caught up in the argument Mm -hmm. as well I really feel for this next generation coming up because they already feel some type of way of just about working in general I mean I've seen a lot of content of people being like oh my gosh I have to go to work and I'm there for five hours I mean I'm there for eight hours and then I come home and like how am I supposed to work out how am I supposed to eat healthy and like they're and they're being honest about it. Like we didn't have social media to but that. We were feeling that same way. OK, yeah, but we didn't have sure. social media to like vent about it and then get all this feedback of like, yeah, I feel the same way. Oh, my gosh. Blah, 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 blah. And I, I feel for those that generation when they start having children, because if they're already feeling overwhelmed now, like you're going to feel really overwhelmed when you yeah. start having kids. And it's just like I think I don't know. Today, it's always like, well, this is wrong. We need to fix it instead of, again, pushing and like doing hard things. If yeah. I've officially become old, you guys, I yes. sound like a boomer right now. No, but I, but I want to say it like not as like, oh my gosh, Gen Z and this, you guys are terrible. No, I want you to know that you can do hard things, yes. that your capacity can increase. 
it may seem literally impossible, but I had those exact same feelings. For sure. When I started working in the corporate world, I'm like, I have no time. And, you know, coming home from the gym, how am I ever going to work out? How am I going to have a husband? How am I going to have a kids? And guess what? It is hard. And you have to, some things you do have to cut out. You have to make a choice. You're like, what do I want to do? Where do I want to spend my time? Um, but it's not like it's not supposed to be easy. You don't learn anything when things are easy. You learn things when things are challenging and when you have to problem solve and when you fall down and you get back up. Like we have to fall. We have to fail yeah. to grow. Um, and I just think that's a lie that's just out there. I'm not blaming it on the generation. I think it's just the lie of social media because you see people doing things like really easily. But I just want you guys to know you're not seeing the whole story. Right. You're not seeing the whole story. And so and the best way to like combat all that stuff is to be in community, is yeah. to be in community with real people that you can share this with and not just dump things on the Internet and get a bunch of feedback in an echo chamber, like really sit down and know somebody and walk through stuff with them, I think is very important. It's just like always comes back to community. If I didn't have community, I would just not be sitting here today because yeah. those are the women that when. My husband was out of town and I had three kids and someone bumped their head on the way there and my son threw up on himself in Target and I was just standing there and a worker's like, I think you should just go home. And I'm like, OK, I'm going to do that. Like I could go tell those stories to the women and be like, oh, my gosh, that happened to me two weeks ago. You're going to be great. Like people just you need people to encourage you through that stuff. Like there's never not going to be hard stuff in anything. So yeah. just to push through that stuff and just be in community with people who can encourage you. Uh, absolutely. Community is essential and real authentic community that can give you feedback, but also encouragement at the same time. And I think all this goes back to like part of this process you're talking about, which we have mentioned before, the pressing and the crushing, like that's part of maturing. That's yeah. part of God forming you and the journey of him developing in you into the person that he's always destined for you to be. And, you know, when we are feeling the pressing, feeling the crushing, the stretching, you know, in those seasons is when the most beautiful things mm -hmm. come yeah. out. When we do those hard things, when we press through um, tough feelings, when we, I don't know, do something hard. It, it is in the moment. It stinks. It's no fun. It doesn't feel great. But there's a point you get to when you've moved through it that you mm -hmm. can look back. And it's just, it's so rewarding. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, I, I do think we have just so much information now and social media makes it appear the as though everybody's doing all the things all the time and, and some people have like all the right <laughs> answers like all these people have answers on how you can go viral just follow this formula and you'll be an influencer in a year <laughs> and all like they just seem like they have it all together and if I just do this one thing then everything will be fine and it's all it's it's not a program or a course that's going to get you to where you want to go it's actually trial and error mm -hmm. and it's just like in science like that's how we have anything on this earth today that is of any value your iphone do you think they made like one version and they were like okay this is great let's put it out yeah. trial and error trial and error trial and testing what worked what didn't work okay let's move forward getting better yeah let's take the time. feedback and get better every time yeah falling uh, yes. like anybody who is successful on the internet right now has fallen a lot yeah. so don't believe the lie that yeah, that it just you have to have it like all figured out and that there's that there, there's an easy way there because there's not. Yeah. Ten easy steps to becoming yeah, an influencer. There's, no, there's no, not any. there's no one formula. <laughs> there's no one way. Yes. None of us are experts and right. have it all figured out. There's more than one way mm -hmm. to be successful. There's more than one way to do work in family life. It's just, yeah, we we all have. But we have to walk our own journey right. and stay in our own lane and figure out where God's pointing us, what, what works best for our families, mm -hmm. all those different kinds of things. And, you know, it made me think of our pastor at our church always talks about, you know, not being a potted plant and instead like growing deep roots and digging deep. And I feel like that applies to this because I, I see a lot of times people get a little 
experience a little agitation, a little feedback, a little offense, offense, a tough thing. And so like a potted plant, they just get up and move on to the next thing. Well, yeah. I'm done here. I'm going to move on instead of moving through it, growing those deep roots, because, you know, they talk about how a tree um, grows deeper roots and gets stronger as winds and storms like blow it side to side. Yeah. And I truly believe the same principle applies to us when we experience that conflict, friction, hard things, stretching and we decide to just dig deep and work through it, that it's going to make you stronger in the long run. And also, I think more successful, that long-term success happens when you really dig in and work through mm -hmm. hard things. Well, and like the cool thing is, is as you're talking about all this stuff, like I'm getting pictures in my head, like I'm seeing a diamond. I'm seeing the crushing and the pressure it takes. And it turns this ugly thing that is a rock into the most beautiful, precious stone mm -hmm. on the world. I'm thinking about, you know, when you get pregnant, your body stretches, you get stretch marks, it's uncomfortable, but then you have this beautiful life that comes out of it. Like all of this stuff is reflected in nature. When you crush olives, you get this beautiful olive oil that tastes delicious and you put on bread. And it's like, there are so many beautiful things. You can see it in nature that come from this pressure and this crushing. And uh, I just don't want people to believe that lie anymore that it should just be easy mm -hmm. because it shouldn't. And I'm not saying like take abuse and take stay in situations no. that are bad, like use discernment. But I just, the God gave me a word a few years ago before I started this whole journey. He was like, I really need you to be unoffendable <laughs> going into this. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can get agitated. I can get upset. But I try to remain unoffended and understand that sometimes things that are coming at me are more have to do with that person than they have to do with me and just ask like, okay, well, all I can control is me. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to do in me in this moment? How do you want to refine me? What do you want to grow in me? And um, it's just, it still sucks, guys. I'm going to be honest. I still don't like it anytime that agitation happens, but at least I have a new mindset of like, okay, how do you want to use this? Like, what do you want to teach me in this? How do you want me to grow in this? And um, so, yeah, that's just a beautiful thing that I feel like is reflected in nature, too. I know. I was even just <laughs> looking out the windows here and it, like, obviously, we're in the winter season and everything is just so barren and dry that I've heard somebody say before, like, you have to go through the winter season where everything dies so that you can have that spring season mm -hmm. where everything's new and fresh and blooming and yeah so i just want to encourage anybody out there who feels like you're in that winter season that you're feeling the pressing and the crushing and you're walking through hard things and i just want to encourage you to keep going that spring is coming and we're always praying over everyone who's watching this and just know that, you know, God has got it. He's got you and spring's coming. Yeah. And we would, I would love to hear your stories in the comments, whether you're a working mom, you're someone who wants to be a mom one yeah. day, you're a grandma who's been through this, or you're an older mom that's been through this. What have you learned? I want to hear your story, your journey, because those things encourage me. We obviously have only lived our lives and we yeah. know there's a lot of ways to do it. And I know that your story matters and your encouragement matters. Or if you're struggling right now, please leave that in the comments. And like, we would love to just pray for your situation and pray for clarity for you. Um, and it just, it's hard, you guys, it's hard. Yeah. We're put in a very hard situation where we have to, you know, mother life and still work and support our family at the same time. So we're just here to be like, man, it is tough. And we're yeah. here to sit in it with you and walk through it with you. Um, but it is beautiful, like family it is, and legacy and generations are just really beautiful. And watching your children become just like little humans that have their own heart, their own mind, and they're just yeah. like going out into the world and they have a message to share is just really beautiful too. And it's really important. It's important work. Yes. It um, so yeah, it was that I had that this is an interesting one. I'd love to, I'm excited to see what you guys are going to think about it. But um, yeah, we just had to sit down. I'm like, let's just talk about this because it's been rolling around in my head for a while. Yeah. It looks completely <laughs> different than I thought it was going to look. But yeah, again, it just goes back to that thing of like, nothing is wasted. Nothing Literally is wasted. nothing is wasted. Everything that you're doing every day when it feels like mundane 
and and not fulfilling and not what it like nothing is wasted you are learning something in that moment in that day today so we just want to speak blessing over you wherever you're at in that journey yeah and just knowing that you're seen you know i've been reading in genesis and i love the part where Hagar sees God like he sees her in a low moment and she said oh you're the God who sees me and I just think about that when I was in the trenches of motherhood and feeling so unseen and undervalued and unappreciated when you're just doing all those not so fun things dishes and diapers and sick kids and all of that so I just Anyone who feels unseen, I want you to know that you are seen and valued and very, very loved. So, oh, so fun. Yeah. But, so it didn't go the way that maybe we thought, but I hope okay. I feel like it was for somebody. It's for somebody for out sure. There. So <laughs> everybody needs a fa- some favorite things in their life to bring a little joy into your day. That's right. That's what favorite things are for me. It's like I really love this, and I need other people to know about it because they might love it too. So what is yours? Well, mine's different today. I have a podcast that I have found and I've been loving. And I actually found it before. It went really viral recently. It's the um, Shannon Brown podcast called, wait, Club Shay Shay, right? On YouTube. And um, it just went really viral viral recently because he had the comedian Cat Williams on there. And he just spilled a whole bunch of tea. That was that podcast? Yes. But uh, but the crazy thing is, is that I started watching it three weeks before that because... I don't know why it just showed up in my feed I think or maybe I found it on a short or something and so I watched the whole Tabitha Brown interview and I just like love Tabitha Brown and if you don't know anything about her go watch the Club Shay Shay podcast it's like two hours long and I loved oh, every wow. minute of it it reminded me a lot of a Cypress Room like her just sharing her story and just all the things that happened along the way and hers is a real like rags to riches story and God just like plucked her out and it is like wild and she's just so sweet and so joyful and I just love her so and I listened to that one and then I listened to one with um, Kirk Franklin who's like the gospel singer and his was really good too and so I was listening to these as I was taking down my Christmas stuff and then all of a sudden I was like I really like this podcast I really love Shannon Sharp and I know nothing about him I know he's like a sportscaster or something like that but I just his interviews are so great and it's like that Theo Vaughn effect like that people just get People just say things on there. Like in his presence, there's just this vulnerability. And I'd love interviews like that that just go really deep and you get to know the person. And there is like no fluff. It is not. I mean, he's got some note cards, but they will go off on some tangents. And Shannon Sharp just has such a beautiful, like joyful spirit, too. So I've really been enjoying that. Oh, Club Shay Shay. fun. I'm going to have to check it out. I've only seen clips. And he has like, I was telling Maggie, he has the best, he has rights to like a popular song and it's so, it's like such a good song. I want rights to a cool song, but it's like, <laughs> for his intro. All, my life, all my life, I've been hustling all my life, pay the price, sacrifice. It's like really good. So <laughs> I hope we don't get copyright struck for my say. terrible singing. <laughs> don't copyright strike, strike us, you two. Uh, my favorite thing is um, the Bible recap. I am... Okay, so I, I don't know what the Bible recap. The is, so Bible to... recap is a book, um, and there is like a corresponding podcast and a journal. Okay, I just have the book, and it's basically you're reading. It's guiding you through reading the Bible chronologically, chronologically. in the order that it was written. Okay, um, for a whole year, reading through the whole Bible in a year. Okay, and okay, is this what our friend Melissa is doing too? Yes. Okay, they were talking about this on Boxer. <laughs> if y'all know our friend Melissa from our friendship episode, they were talking about this on Boxer. I'm like, y'all. Y'all know I'm not going to add something on top. I don't have, no, but enjoy. (laughs) I'm really enjoying it so far this year. I love the chronological aspect of it. And they give like a little, there is like a one page summary that categorizes like, it talks about the God moments in it. And there's actually a corresponding like podcast that for each section you read as well, if somebody prefers like to listen to it after each reading. But so exciting. I am really enjoying it and it's helping me to do it alongside a friend so that okay. I don't drop off when it's a harder section. Of okay. Reading. And can you get the book on Amazon? Yeah. It's a book. Okay, cool. So we'll link that in the description box. We'll link Club Shay Shay. That, we had like polar opposite favorite things today, which I, I love um, in the description box. And we have a little bit of celebrating to do because we why? do. 
because we hit the 1,000 subscriber mark on YouTube. Yeah, it's slow growing, but it's okay. Like, we're here, we're showing up, we're learning, um, we're doing those remote interviews, which I hope you guys are enjoying, and we're learning something every time we do one, how to yes. improve yes. the audio, improve the, you know, the camera and everything like that, so. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So we're Good rolling. Stuff. We're rolling. And we appreciate you guys because if you're here and still watching this, you're a real one. You so are a real one. You. Thanks for that watch. <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> well, th- I guess that's it for now. We'll mm-hmm. be back with another podcast soon. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification button so that you know the next time we upload a new episode. And we'll see you next time in the Cypress Room. Mm-hmm.